in, in Drevo, you are head of floating offshore wind at UK-based Corio Generation, which has a very large floating wind pipeline. And uh, can you tell us what your projects are in a nutshell? So thank you for inviting us. And yeah, Corio has uh, a large um, fixed bottom uh, pipeline and also floating. And currently, the project we're developing, where we're partnering also with Total, is in South Korea, where we have um, quite a large project uh, being developed. Um, also, we're working on, of course, the partnership here in France, uh, hoping to be selected for the next round. Uh, we're also developing floating in Norway, where there is um, a decision going to be made this year. And then we've partnered up in Spain, in Portugal, and we're looking very much around the world uh, where there are floating options, Celtic Sea, and so forth. Looking at all these markets and projects, what would you say are the main hurdles for floating to really go through the roof? So floating is in the early stages. Uh, similar, we can draw some um, similarities to fixed bottom. Um, and also looking at how many, many countries have started their journey on uh, this industry. So uh, our experience in Koryo is from being one of the first in Taiwan, uh, which was a very new market for fixed bottom. Uh, and there it was very much around working with regulators, making sure we had the appropriate um, plans in place and also working with the supply chain to mature this industry so that the solutions could be locally built um, and that was a, a key. Uh, that is one of the hurdles we see also for floating. It's happening in many new countries uh, which have not done this before. It's a new industry so it's about uh, working with the regulators to make sure that we have appropriate plans and with the supply chain to make sure that we can do this in, in a very um, consistent way and, and, uh, and bring more industrial jobs also locally. I suppose the solutions are different uh, depending on the country and on the project, right? Yeah, so what we see is that the, the technical solutions are different because it, they're also very much dependent on the conditions at site. Uh, we've seen various um, uh, projects in the water. We have um, pilots out there. We also have uh, wind farms uh, floating, but they're still very small and very few. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's still in the early day, uh, days to, to develop this, but yeah, definitely something that's coming. And as I believe I heard, I couldn't take all the French, but uh, there is a belief that floating is um, going to happen um, because what it it pays to is that not every country has the seabed conditions to have the fo a fixed bottom solution. They have to go into deeper waters, which where floating is really the, uh, the right thing. And also you can access better wind sources normally if you can uh, go into deeper water. So it's a, it's a positive uh, game there. Absolutely. Do you think there are many lessons or some lessons that floating can learn from bottom fixed wind? Yeah, I think we, we are definitely building on the, the shoulders of, or standing on the shoulders of giants when we're uh, doing what has already happened in fixed bottom. So, in, and one of the major changes for fixed bottom was really size of turbines. You know, scaling them up meant that you had fewer of them where you could get economies of scale and also uh, bigger wind farms. So, those are the, the some of the learnings we, sh we can take on because we're of course going to be uh, similarly when it comes to the size of the turbine. A, a real benefit for floating is that you can assemble uh, everything um, by the key, which um, normally is more efficient than having to do it in the water itself where you have more uh, weather limitations and other constraints. So the, you know, there's lots to learn from FIX, but this is a different environment. And also, um, we need to pay attention to what are the risks that are different so that the designs that are created are going to last for the longevity we want them to last for. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sonia and Debro. Uh, Antoine Becker, you are Business Development Director, Southwest Europe at Total Energy. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you to, to have me today. <laughs> Can you first tell us about your project when it comes to floating wind energy in Europe? Yeah, uh, there should be a map somewhere. A slide, I think. Yeah. yeah. There we go. Okay. Uh, good. Good uh, morning, everybody. So Total uh, started uh, in 2019 uh, into offshore wind, bidding on the French uh, bid uh, Wieserstedt. Apparently, we lost because it's not on the map. 
Anyway, uh, in a few years now, the pipeline is 12 gigawatts. Uh, one quarter of that is uh, floating, mostly with uh, Corio in uh, Korea, what we call BADA, and also in, uh, in France on the Olmel project, uh, project with care. So today we are about 200 people uh, dedicated to offshore wind. Today we try to leverage on uh, our offshore uh, past, not always uh, obvious, but still we, we, we are building our uh, experience and knowledge uh, in that industry. All right, and uh, can I ask you the same thing as I asked Sonia? What do you think is, I mean, is there one big main hurdle for you to floating offshore wind? Okay, but to tell the truth, we, we knew the questions, and so, so we came prepared. Uh, the, the main uh, hurdle for me, I'll try to focus on uh, regulatory issues. Today, we, we have a lot of, com of announcements from the states, good news. There will be a lot of offshore wind, a lot of floating, but there is no commitment, no clear planning, no volume. So today for the supply chain, for the infrastructure, and I'm talking about harbors or the grid, there is no way to make the investments that are needed for offshore wind and in particular for uh, floating. If I take the example of the port, it's huge investments and a huge change of model. If you have uh, one project every two years, you will not make a change. You will keep be uh, a coal importer and uh, you won't change for a, a floater and turbine integrator. So what we need is uh, commitments from the states and we need pace and volume. What I mean by pace? It means we should stop looking for the perfect tender rules. Now we have uh, ideas of uh, how we should do this. We let, let's go. Uh, we should uh, reduce the timing of, of permitting. Today there is no cap on the, on the permitting instruction, so you wait years before you can get your permit. We don't need phasing. Why, do you, why won't we go for a one gigawatt uh, zone if there is one gigawatt to be attributed? Why in two steps? You lose time, you lose money. And for that, if we want uh, bigger volumes, bigger planning, it means that su supply chain will invest, infrastructure will develop, and for that you need a lot of gigawatt attributed. That means a lot of gigawatt attributed at once in several wind farms. So I think this is the main hurdle that we see for floating because most of the countries that will do floating around Mediterranean Sea and in the Atlantic, maybe France, uh, are looking at step-by-step -step approach, which will not allow for a, a big development. Do you think that there are specific lessons that floating can learn from uh, bottom fixed? Before that, we had the, the second hurdle that I should. <laughs> well, I thought you, res you talked about several bottlenecks. I mean, are there any other hurdles that no, you uh, like to I, mention? I, I'm joking because I. I was describing um, the first hurdle, which is regulatory, and the second one is, I think, CFD approach is good for floating. We need that uh, because uh, floating today is not mature, and so there is no way it will be grid parity. But today, we have to commit to a price seven years before COD in a technology we don't know, which is not mature. And it, it creates a lot of stress on the state because the state has to develop, has to make surveys, has to uh, provide us with the technical data so that we can bid. And that's not the job of the state. The state should make regulation and the developer should develop. So to us, it would be better to attribute the lease than the developers develop and go for the auction if they want to. And if it's grid parity, then we go for merchant approach. That way, floating, we will have project with the right price and not a price that makes a project losing money because it's good at the beginning, it's good for the consumer, but at the end, developers, they will stop developing if they, have, if they are not earning money. So to me, what's good also is to think of a two-step approach to allow for the technology to become mature and one day it will converge to bottom fixed 
because it's, it's going to be grid parity and we, we won't need any, any uh, CFD in that case. Hmm. And so going to your question. Yeah, uh, so, so what would be the lessons then that you could learn from bottom fixed? So wh wh what we saw is bottom fixed has become grid parity in 20 years uh, in, most, in some countries of the North Sea. And what happened is it became grid parity although there are a lot of offshore risks. It's offshore operations risks, uh, bottom fixed. Now we have a technology not mature, but with a great advantage is you exchange offshore risks with manufacturing risks, meaning you have to find a way to manufacture your floaters uh, onshore, but at a good price. It seems doable because we are onshore. We know how to do that. But for that, as for bottom fixed, we need volume, we need planning, and we need a bit of commitment. Do you want to react to that, or do you agree? So I agree with volume. I think that's essential in order to succeed. Like we saw in bottom fix, this was only when the sizes of project increased and also the number of projects. That's when the real costs were coming down. So I agree very much that for floating for that to happen as well, we need to move to the larger scale projects. And that will be essential for the industry really to take the next steps and, and bring down cost levels like we all want and we all want to ensure. But nobody can expect that this just happens without real projects. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for your insight. Thanks. Thank you.